This presentation will explain to the best of our current knowledge why the two major causes of tendinitis are hearing loss and problems of the muscles of the head and neck. It will also explain why sometimes, but not always, hearing loss and problems of the muscle of the head and neck can cause tinnitus, and sometimes tinnitus does not result. Even if there should be a total hearing loss, one out of five people with total hearing loss does not develop tinnitus. In the same manner, cutting the nerve, making a person deaf in one ear, does not always abolish tinnitus. It sometimes does and sometimes does not. We'll also explain, to the best of our understanding, why a certain class of medications sometimes, but not always, quiets tinnitus. So let's begin. This first slide shows the oracle or pinna, our external ear, whose job is to collect the sound. The sound then travels down the external auditory canal toward the eardrum. The eardrum or tympanic membrane, the eardrum or tympanic membrane then collects this sound, passes it across the three smallest bones in our body, shown by the number two on this slide. The sound tra is transferred from the eardrum to the inner ear, where on number four on this slide, it travels to the part of the inner ear known as the cochlea. And the cochlea's job is to convert the sounds into nerve impulses, shown as number five. And the nerve then carries the information to the brain. Here is shown different levels of the brain. The nerve travels only to the cochlear nuclei. There's a pair on each side, one in back called dorsal cochlear nucleus, and one in front called ventral cochlear nucleus. From the cochlear nuclei, the signals have to travel up the brain until the level of consciousness, which is shown at the top section of this slide. Perception occurs either at the medial genicular body of a shore and the acoustic area of the temporal lobe. So as you can see, the nerve goes into the brain at a very primitive area of the brain and it has to travel out of the cochlear nuclei to reach a level of perception. So to review again, from the inner ear, circled in red, from the <coughs> inner ear known as the cochlea, the sound is converted to nerve impulses and the nerve impulses travel along the auditory nerve to the brain. The auditory nerve projects to just two places in the brain called the cochlear nuclei, one in front called the ventral cochlear nucleus and one in back called the dorsal cochlear nucleus. Now, when trouble occurs in the cochlea, so it's dysfunctioning, that is, there's hearing loss, then there's decreased activity coming out of the cochlea to excite the auditory nerve. So we have decreased activity in the cochlea. That results in decreased activity in the auditory nerve. And that results in decreased activity in the ventral cochlea nucleus. But paradoxically, the dorsal cochlear nucleus develops increased activity due to the decreased activity coming in from the auditory nerve. This has been well established in multiple experimental animals. So we are on firm footing here that hearing loss, most, most commonly coming from the cochlea, but sometimes from the auditory nerve, results in increased activity in the dorsal cochlear nucleus, and that is thought to be the site of tinnitus from hearing loss. Now, just as a reminder, the activity in the cochlear nuclei does not reach perception until it gets out of the cochlear nuclei to much higher levels of the brain. Now, if we look at the dorsal cochlear nucleus where tinnitus appears to be originating from, there are multiple inputs to the cochlear nucleus, not only auditory inputs, shown here on the left, but other inputs as well. The major other input appears to be 
somatosensory inputs that are coming from the muscles, tendons, and joints of the head and neck. The somatosensory inputs are coming from the muscle spindles, which are telling the length of the muscle. From the tendons, is providing information about the amount of tension in the muscle, and the joint receptors are telling the brain the position of the joints of the head and upper neck. Now remember that information has to leave the dorsal cochleus and the dorsal cochlear nucleus, or DCN, and the only way out, as shown in this diagram, is through the fusiform cells. So the whole point of the dorsal cochlear nucleus, everything that's going on within the dorsal cochlear nucleus, is to modulate the activity of the fusiform cells. This next diagram, you can see that there are auditory inputs and somatosensory inputs. The only auditory input that directly excites the fusiform cell is from what is shown in red as type 1 primary afferents. These can directly excite the fusiform cell. All other inputs to the dorsal cochlear nucleus do not directly excite or inhibit the fusiform cell, but go through another cell called the granule cell. The granule cell then sends inputs into the molecular layer, as shown as on the top of this diagram, and then that, as a, a parallel fiber, the molecular layer fibers from the granule cells can either excite directly the fusiform cell or inhibit the fusiform cell by first exciting another cell here shown as cartwheel cell the cartwheel cell, in turn, inhibits the fusiform cell. So either the type 2 primary efferents coming from the outer hair cells of the inner ear or cochlea, or the somatosensory inputs, can in inhibit the fusiform cell by first exciting the granule cell, which in turn excites the cartwheel cell, which in turn inhibits the fusiform cell. So it's a very complex structure. For the uh, sake of our instructions, we can consider simplifying this structure. Again, the only way out of the dorsal cochlear nucleus is through the fusiform cells. They can be either excited by certain things and inhibited by other things. In this diagram, we show excitation as coming from the auditory nerve and inhibition from other parts of the auditory nerve fibers, as well as the somatosensory inputs. Now, our hypothesis is that whether or not someone develops tinnitus depends upon the relative balance between excitation and inhibition to the fusiform cells. If, due to a hearing loss, there's more loss of excitation than loss of inhibition, then there will be no tinnitus. On the other hand, if there should be more loss of inhibition than there is excitation, then in this case, one would develop tinnitus. It is our hypothesis then that, that whether or not one develops tinnitus depends on the relative input of excitation inhibition upon the fusiform cell. So that this can explain why some, but not all people, develop tinnitus with hearing loss. This can explain why some, but not all people, get rid of the tinnitus when their auditory nerve is cut. This can explain why profoundly deaf people who cannot hear at all, some will have tinnitus and some will not have tinnitus. It will all depend on the relative excitation and inhibition occurring at the level of the 
fusiform cells. Now, if we consider the fusiform cell again and note the excitation inhibition, we note that inhibition is mediated through the chemical called GABA, an abbreviation for gamma amino butyric acid. So if we can change the relative excitation and inhibition of the fusiform cell more towards inhibition, then we have a chance of quieting tinnitus. There are drugs that make GABA more powerful. GABA is a major inhibitory neurotransmitter of the brain and spinal cord. The class of drugs known as benzodiazepines, which include clonazepam or clonopin, diazepam or valium, lorazepam or ativan, alprazolam or xanax, they work by making GABA more powerful. And in so doing throughout the nervous system, not just the auditory system, they can do several things. They can suppress tinnitus, they can promote sleep, they can reduce anxiety, they can reduce tremor of the arms, legs, head, or voice, they can reduce burning tongue, they can improve the restless leg syndrome, they can suppress epilepsy, and they can relieve muscle spasms. These are all the uses for benzodiazepine, and all because they promote inhibition by making GABA more powerful where it exists. And we believe that is why three studies have shown that more than 75% of people have their tinnitus quieted by the use of benzodiazepines. One study was done with alprazolam, and the other study was done with bromazepam. A third study was done with clonazepam. So in conclusion, we can consider tinnitus as a chemical imbalance of the dorsal cochlear nucleus. Tinnitus occurs when the dorsal cochlear nucleus is GABA deficient. This can occur from loss of the type 2 auditory nerve fibers, which come from the outer hair cell system. Based on this hypothesis and supported by several studies, enhancing GABA pharmacologically, such as with the use of benzodiazepines, or enhancing GABA physiologically, such as exciting type 2 cells with electrical stimulation, or through increasing the somatosensory inputs to the dorsal to cochlear nucleus, all can quiet tinnitus based on our hypothesis. So again, tinnitus can be considered a chemical imbalance of the dorsal cochlear nucleus due to GABA deficiency. And this hypothesis can account for why some people do and do not develop tinnitus from hearing loss, whether because by a malfunctioning of the inner ear or nerve or after the nerve has been cut. In this most recent version of the tinnitus tutorial, we've added now a study that was just completed by my colleague Dr. Nam and his co-workers in South Korea. They showed that clonazepam quiets tinnitus just as two previous studies showed a similar result. In this slide, what is shown is the loudness of their subject's tinnitus before, indicated as pre, and then after, indicated as post, by receiving th three weeks of clonazepam. You can see that the trend is in the most subjects for the tinnitus to quiet. The average went from five down to three, and overall, again, a very similar number, 74% of subjects had their tinnitus quieted by three weeks of clonazepam. In fact, Three of the subjects, three of the 38 subjects, heard no tinnitus while receiving clonazepam. You can see that their numbers went down to zero for these three subjects after they were on clonazepam for three weeks. In conclusion, because of these two factors, individualization of the dose and trials with more than one benzodiazepine, percent of individual patients in whom the tinnitus will be not heard while on clonazepam will be much higher than this 7% that was found in this recent clonazepam study.